come out on this first Sunday of January. So it's good to see you this morning. Um, quick announcements. Anybody have any announcement need to be made at this time? Bill's moving like he, or he's going to be the, the bearer of the uh, microphone. Linda? No, no choir practice tomorrow night. Community table opens back up this coming Tuesday. There's lots of bread and desserts in the back for anybody that can use them. Thanks. Thank you, Judy. Who else? Bill? Uh, for the men, men's fellowship will start back up this month, so the fourth Thursday of each month. So put it on your calendar, the fourth Thursday of each month, we'll have men's fellowship back here. We'll have a meal and just uh, get together. So remember that, the fourth Thursday of each month. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Anyone else have an announcement? Okay, I've got two. Uh, first one is I'd like to uh, extend to you uh, the invitation to be involved this upcoming year as a volunteer and mission. You know, we have a lot of missions going on in our church. And I know that the food pantry could use some, oh yeah, we should have done that already. <laughs> well, we're not in the sacred part yet. We're doing announcements and there's nothing sacred about that. But anyway, uh, if you would like to volunteer two days out of a month for two and a half hours each time to the food pantry uh, that will be meeting down at, uh, you know, where they open up on Tuesdays. Uh, please uh, contact Margie because I know that uh, we have volunteers, but, you know, sometimes we need to continue to uh, move that pool of people willing to do something. So. Uh, she's in need of some fresh new faces and old faces alike. She needs everyone, you know. Uh, uh, y'all took that the wrong way, didn't you? So, uh, I can tell y'all are sitting there going, he just insulted the entire church. Way to go. Good start for the new year, preach. Uh, anyhow, uh, really, this is a, it's a great ministry, and and you want to find a place in, in the church to give of yourself, this is a great place to do it. And uh, Kathy, I don't know if you need that type of, uh, I know you've got a fairly large team. You're good right now? Okay. All right, for the clothing ministry. So, uh, The second announcement, um, you know, I made a challenge a couple of weeks ago. I guess it's been uh, about us taking up a love offering in the first Sunday of January for the uh, victims of the terrible tornadoes that went through Tennessee, Kentucky, uh, Missouri, um, Illinois, and uh, Arkansas. I would like to extend that since we, right now we're going through a period where the, because of the virus there's this sort of wave of people coming and going to church. Let's make that an uh, where I'm going to have a box made up this week where starting next Sunday uh, I'm going to put that box in the back of the church and throughout the month of January all the way up to the first of February let's have that open for anyone as they are coming and going as an opportunity to give to that very worthy mission to reach out to the people that uh, you know we don't see the news anymore on it but let me assure you, my friends, these people are still homeless. They're still devastated. They are still uh, grieving. And there's a lot of need, a lot of need all throughout those states. So let this be our gift to Jesus, our Christmas gift to Jesus. And I would challenge you to give financially, if that's uh, as much as you gave to the most expensive gift you gave somebody for Christmas and let that be your challenge. And so please, uh, let's keep that in mind. So next Sunday, you'll see that box, and it's gonna remain there, so that hopefully by the end of January, the first of February, the people that have come and gone uh, will have had the opportunity, you know, to come through and, and give their, their love offering. So are there any other announcements? Anybody else? Okay, if not, then let us stand and let's greet one another without hugs and kisses. And, uh, you know, just wave to them, say, it's good to have you in church this morning, then remain standing.
That might be a little too cool now, right? I never know what to do. You can never win with this thing. All right, our first hymn this morning is Love Came Down at Christmas. At this time, I'd like to give you an opportunity to lift up those uh, that you would like to be in prayer for. I know there are people that are fighting the virus and different strains of the virus, and we need to keep all these people in our prayers. Uh, uh, are there any other prayer requests that you'd like to lift up this morning? Any person? Yes, Eva. appreciate everybody praying for our son-in-law, Wayne Cress. He is doing better. He is coming to rehab tomorrow afternoon to Salisbury, and hopefully they'll be able to do something for him to be able to walk again. So far, he's not. So keep on praying. Thank it's you. good to hear him making progress. So we continue to pray for Wayne. So, all right. Dave? Uh, the Murray family's had a death in their family. Um, he's my sales manager and his brother, young man, who works on the um, Jordan, no, not Jordan Lake, but uh, Lake Norman uh, Police Department, passed away in his 30s from a blood clot. From, oh, my goodness. From what we know, just think of that young family. Thank you, Dave. I hear more and more of the stories like that. Yes, Kathy. Um, our friend Mike has come out of his coma a little bit, and he is able to recognize voices and different things. So thank you for your prayers, and um, continue to pray for him. It's been three weeks now. Okay. Yes, Bill. Uh, Keith Brown called me this morning and asked that we pray for his wife, Rhonda, who's uh, been sick this past few days. She's in the bed. He said if she's not feeling better tomorrow, they're going, of course, and have tests to see if she has COVID or whatever. But right now, just keep uh, Keith and uh, Rhonda Brown in your prayers also. Okay. Thank you for that. Anyone else? Friends, I have a very dear friend uh, I would like you to be in prayer for and lives in Blairsville, Georgia. Her name's Beverly Harris. She is in the hospital in Gainesville, and uh, she is in uh, has been in serious condition for days now. So just keep Beverly Harris in your prayer. Yes, Beth? Um, Tom and Peg Dial, D-I-L. Um, both of them are in the hospital with COVID and Tom is on a ventilator. Let's be so. in prayer for both of these people. Yes, Charlie? Pray for Wesley. He's having surgery this week. Wesley's having his surgery this week, so let's be in prayer for him and God's hand to steady the hand of the surgeon. 
Anyone else? In the back, uh, Jamie. Thank y'all for praying for my dad. Um, <clears throat> he's still not doing too hot. He's um, getting used to his oxygen and whatnot. And because of insurance reasons, he can't have any more tests done for another month. And, but they, they believe he does have spots on his lung for cancer spots. So they're, they can't know for sure for reinsurance reasons for a couple, for a little bit longer. Um, and then thanks for praying for us. We're all finally well. Uh, Praise God. <laughs> and uh, re remember us especially this week. Uh, I start a new job, and Jonathan has decided that he is grown and moving out. So, <laughs> yeah, my nerves are shot. <laughs> Jamie's crying, and Daddy's saying it's about time. So, <laughs> nah. Good to see you, Jonathan. Anyone else? Yes, Debbie. Rem Ramona's sister. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Let's be in prayer for her. Anyone else? All right, if not, let's go to our Lord and pray this morning together. Heavenly Father, we, we are grateful any time that we can come together and pray together as believers. And we, on this first Sunday of, of January 2022, we come here in this church building and we come with a heart of expectation uh, that your Holy Spirit will move and speak to our hearts today and that we will be blessed just being faithful we pray, Lord, for those that are watching this morning at home. Maybe some are ill and not well, but uh, are finding it encouraging to be able to watch their home church. Lord, bless them and bring healing to them. For all those that have been mentioned by name today, Lord, we put them at the altar of your mercy and grace and healing power. And we thank you, Lord, for their faith we pray, O oh God, that you will sustain them in their struggle with their physical health and bring healing to their bodies and to their minds and to their souls. Lord, for our nation, we pray for <coughs> excuse me, a spiritual hunger to be uh, lit and become a living thing throughout our nation as we face a new year where people are looking for answers, answers that come from a holy and loving God. Lord, let us be available to be instruments of your peace in this world. Let us be faithful, we pray, O oh God, and that we can be that disciple of, of Jesus Christ as we witness and reach out to other people. And we do this in your name. Lord, bless our country and bless those throughout the land that are meeting in churches right now all over this land that you will stir their hearts and move in their midst. And we pray all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. This time I'd like to ask the ushers if they would come forward and receive our morning offering. Lord, it is a blessing to give to our church, and we're thankful for the opportunity. And we pray, O oh Lord, that this giving will be something that we, we become accustomed to because it grows us in our faith. And we thank you for that opportunity today. So bless these offerings, Lord, that they be used for the furthering of your kingdom. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, choir. Small in number, but powerful in spirit. We appreciate you uh, singing for us this morning. You know, when I approach, you know, actually this Sunday, uh, it, it could be debated actually, or next Sunday actually should be the first Sunday of Epiphany. Epiphany actually is that time when we celebrate the, uh, the Magi. A lot of people uh, believe that the Magi came in at the last minute, you know, of the birth of Jesus into the stable. You know, they got there just in time uh, following the star. But actually, if you look at that story close, you'll see the good chances are that Jesus uh, and Joseph and, and Mary were still, back, were still in Bethlehem. But he might have uh, risen to the age of at least two years old at that point. They traveled over a thousand miles to come and see him. So I, I'm, I was tempted to preach on that today, but I didn't, feel, I didn't feel that that's what I need to do. So I changed gears at the last minute because I was thinking to myself, you know, we, how many watched some kind of show on, on December 31st? If you weren't partying somewhere, how many watched the... Uh, show where everybody does their resolutions. You hear about the resolutions or 
people make resolutions, you know, it might have been the end of the year thing or something on TV. And we do this every year. You know, what's your New Year's resolution? What are you going to do? And, you know, we're all guilty of making really good intentions, uh, you know, when we give those resolutions like, I am going to cut down on fat. I'm not eating any more fat back. Forget, forget the fat back and the, and the country ham. I'm not having any more of that. And, of course, you make it about three days, and that's about it. You know, and then we sort of, forget, conveniently, we forget it. You know, we go on with life. You know, we get, we, you know, I don't think we're intentionally saying, I'm going to be really mean and forget doing this. We just get on with life. You know, we get busy. You go to your jobs. You, you're hitting the, the hours that you're accustomed to hitting, you know, if you're an early riser or not, or a late night person. Your life goes on. And so good intentions have led down a road of nothing, really. So I'm thinking about our, our spiritual health, because I'm really concerned about that. I'm concerned, as a Christian, about the spiritual health of our nation and our churches. No matter what the denomination, I really believe that the Lord is calling us to a really sacred hour right now to really be a vessel of, of not entertaining people or trying to appease people, but to grow people in the faith, inspire people to really be a disciple and to live your faith. Some of you are doing that. I, I was telling uh, some others just actually a few days ago, I said, you know, I've never seen in all the churches that, and I've told you before, in all the churches that I've served down since 1981, uh, I have never seen a church that had as many people volunteer. Usually you have to really seek them out and you have to recruit them and inspire them and, and you know, try to get them. And, and what do we do in the churches a lot of times is when we do get some really good volunteers, we work them to death. We work them until they can't hardly walk anymore and say, aren't you glad you came to our church? You know, and, uh, you know, and then they say, well, I really need to take a Sunday off. Is, is, that, is that okay? Or is, am I going to be judged by God if I take a Sunday off? And no, you're not going to be judged by God if you take a Sunday off. You know, we, we, we beat people up, not intentionally, because we find people that will do it. But this church has been unique in the sense that there have been quite a few people that are volunteering. And I mean, quite a few. And I believe that's why God's blessing the mission in this church. Uh, but we haven't arrived, so don't get too comfortable. But I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for your willingness to be uh, a church that's, that's sensitive to the community and the suffering of other people. Well, this morning I, I'm thinking to myself, actually it wasn't this morning, it was the other day, I was sitting in my office thinking, you know, if we had an urgency in our soul what would that urgency be about as we enter into a, a new phase, a new year? We, every year we hope, oh boy, I hope this year is going to be better than last year. Have you already said that? You know, say, oh boy, I hope 22 is better than 21. And then the year before, did we not say, I hope 21 is better than 20? And it seems like the more we say that, the worse it gets. I, I'm almost afraid not to say anything. I, I'm just, I'll just keep my mouth shut and not say anything. Well, how about spiritually in your life? I want you to look inwardly. And I want to see and hear from you throughout this year, how are you growing in your relationship with God and the Savior of the world? And why should we do that? And I, and I think we should do that because we are commanded to do it. The Bible teaches us that. But you also need more than a command. You need to have a desire to do it. And when you have that desire, then you can be used by God to do amazing things. And so this morning, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, there is, there is a challenge to all of you and me, to the church, how we are to live our life as we prepare 
for the coming of Jesus. Now, I don't know where you are in your faith. I know some people are here and some people are there and we're all at a different place. But one thing I am certain of, that the scriptures are the inspired word of God and they speak truth. And in the Bible, we are taught about certain things that we need to look out for as, as believers. It, this is written to us for the coming of the Son of Man for the last time. You hear about it. People have made movies about it. There's theological debates about it. I, I don't want to get into any of that. I want to know in what way are you preparing your soul for Jesus' return? Because if he comes in the year 2022, and it wouldn't surprise me, are you ready? Are you truly ready for this great happening? Can you process this this prophecy in the Bible without trying to sort of set it off in the future, but start to look at it as a very present promise that can very well happen. It's not a superstitious teaching. It's actually a promise. It's something that's good. It's good for the saints of God. But what should I be doing? Preacher, you know, you talk about that, but what do I do in the meantime? Jesus answers that question. Our scripture this morning will show us. So in Matthew chapter 25, which follows Matthew 24, and Matthew 24 is that passage that tells us about the signs of Jesus' return. Matthew 25 tells us, actually in three ways throughout that whole chapter, you know, whether you're reading about the ten bridesmaids having enough oil in their lamp, or whether you're reading about the man that was going on a journey and he summoned his slaves and he divided talents among them, one that had five talents, one that had two, and then one that had one. And what do we do with what God gave us? And then we come up to this one. And it begins in verse 31 by read, that listen to this first verse. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. So he's talking about him coming back right out of the gate. When he comes back, he's not going to come back as a new personality that we have to figure out. No, he's going to come in all his glory. He's going to come back actually with angelic beings. You know, Jesus, how he ascended into heaven after his resurrection and angels joined him, and he went into the clouds, however you want to interpret that. I just interpret it the way it's said. He said, I will return the same way. So when he comes back, there's not going to be a question in your mind, oh, oh is he living in Jerusalem? Or is he over here in a small little town, you know, in Missouri somewhere? No, when he comes back, you're going to know. Because there's going to be a host of angels that will accompany him. And he will sit, it says, on a throne. And on that throne, let's see what else the Bible tells us. Let's just read it. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at the right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food, and I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing, and I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it we saw you hungry? and gave you food, or thirsty, and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you, a stranger, and welcomed you, or naked, and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick, or in prison, and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family. Notice that when you've done it to the least of these. He associ associates the least of these with members of his family. 
They're heirs of the kingdom. He says, then you have done it unto me. You know, then he will say to those at the left hand that you are accursed, depart from me into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. There's a lot of messages in that passage, a whole lot. And they're all sort of connected to the previous things about the talents. You know, and the teachings of this particular uh, passage about the handmaidens who didn't, some ha half had half the, enough oil to get them through the night for the bridegroom and half did not. The story is telling us that we have a choice in our life, folks. Here we are on January the 2nd, 2000. 22 in the year of our Lord. And we have a year ahead of us, we think. We don't know if Christ will come back in the midst of this sermon right now or will he come back sometime throughout this year. We don't know this. The Bible doesn't teach us that we will know when. It just teaches us here are the signs to look for. And when you see this, you will know that the time is near. So we are looking and seeing that the time is near. It's obvious. If you're reading the scriptures and you're looking at the world, you can't come to another conclusion as a believer. So I'm standing here before you today and I want to ask you a serious question. Is how are you preparing your spiritual hearts for this great day of glory? A day the Lamb of God will then separate the sheep from the goats. Those who truly are the beloved, those who are truly the faithful, versus those who are pretending to be the faithful. Those with excuses while they couldn't be faithful. How many of us have entertained angels unaware and didn't realize it? People in our life along the way that inspired us or they are very memorable now some very memorable people are not necessarily people that have inspired you they challenged you though and they challenged your faith how compassionate am i really lord with those that i don't really know that well how welcoming am i and how important is it that we as the believers Welcome the people in our community regardless of who they are, regardless of their mannerisms, regardless of their circumstance, regardless of where they are in life. Are we a welcoming church and a loving church? Now, I guarantee you that I can stand in most churches in America today and ask that question, and every one of these churches are going to re respond, Oh, yes, we're a welcoming and loving church. Folks, I have served churches that were not welcoming and loving. They thought they were, but they were everything but. I've been in churches where they had assigned seats. <laughs> they put their pillow in their seat to make sure that nobody got that seat. I've seen them push visitors away out of their seats because that's where I've always sat. I'll tell you, one of the worst things you can ever do to get people upset with you, and in my youth I used to do these things, and I never did learn my lesson well, but I should have, 
is have everybody stand up and everybody go sit somewhere else different than where you normally sit. You want to make some people mad, that'll do it. You know another one? If I were to come up here and move this candle right here, you're going to sort of look through me through the whole sermon and go, man, that's driving me nuts. You've got to fix that. I had a church that a family gave a grand piano as in memory of their loved one as a gift. And it was a large church. And so we had a lot of space up here. And we put the grand piano up on the stage. But because it wasn't symmetrical, <laughs> I heard <clears throat> for four years, that's all I could take, and I was gone. But for four years, I heard this constant whining and complaining about how that grand piano just doesn't fit. They couldn't see the wonderful gift. Oh, they, met, they let the family know. They didn't like the family anyway. So they made, oh, they're just bragging. That's what they're doing. They're just showing off. And I'm thinking, what? This is a wonderful gift to the church, and you're worried about it not looking right? What's wrong with a grand piano? It looks right anywhere it's at. It's amazing to me how many people believe that they're really good followers of Jesus and they're really a kind, caring, loving, welcoming people. And really what they're looking for are people that are pretty much like them, not different than them. Different makes me uneasy. Different is awkward. I don't know how to speak to different. How do you embrace different? So what do we do many times in the church when somebody is really different, and I don't mean a little different, really different, we whisper behind the scenes, there's something wrong with him. What's the matter with him? And then somebody in the choir will say, well, God, I hope they don't start wanting to sing in the choir. <laughs> My God, they can get up here in the choir and mess everything up. Yeah, we need to push him off. Let him be an usher or something. You know, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry about that, all the ushers, you know. <laughs> it's people that we meet along the way that are just different. And when I lived in Cherokee, I met a lot of these people because a lot of transients would always come to the Indian reservation. I don't know why, but for some reason they really leave somehow the answer to their problems lie on a reservation and so they would travel f across the country to be with their people and they're just as non-Indian as I am but yet they knew that somehow there they were going to find the answers well I heard a long time ago that my great grandmother was an Indian princess and then they give you all of this spill they're searching for something in life. They're looking to be accepted, loved, and know that they count. And the church can sometimes be cruel to these people. And I'm afraid, folks, we all have been there. At one time, we misjudged people. And we assumed things. And, we're, and we should really feel bad about that. Because, you know, I keep thinking of that scripture I said a few minutes ago, that there will be times that we'll entertain angels unaware. And I wonder how many angels have I entertained that were homeless on the street of a city or some strange character in the community that you just want to distance yourself from or someone that just made you uncomfortable. And you really didn't know their heart and you didn't know their story, nor did you want to know. What you knew is what you heard from other people in the community. And you took that as the gospel, and you thought it was true. Now, the Bible is telling us that when we open our arms, my friends, when we are reaching out to the least of these, it does not tell us that they have to be uh, willing to change to our standard. 
It's telling us that we reach to them as Jesus would reach to them. No matter where their place is in society, no matter what they've done or haven't done, no matter what we think they've done or might do. Example. It's easy to fall into this. I, when Rena and I were down at her, uh, her mother and father's, before they passed away, their neighbors are really nice. They had uh, uh, two people that were just wonderful people. They're next door neighbors. She was a pediatrician, and he worked in the business part of, their, of her medical profession. They worked as a team. Well, they took in a family uh, that was homeless, looking for. They took a man to their home. And I realized this, and I said, "Wow, that's that's pretty good, man. I mean, you take you didn't you didn't put them in the shelter, man. You you brought them in the house. In fact, they left them there on weekends, so the kids could swim in their pool. I'm impressed." to him and I said, you guys, you inspire me. I said, Do you, you being the voice in the hands of Jesus to these people, it, it's, it inspires me. Well, weeks passed and I noticed that the car that they were driving in were, continued to keep coming back. It was gone for a while and then it kept coming back. The promises were made, the plans were discussed, where do I go from here? When do I apply for a job? How do I get that job? And it was ever done. And so they felt very used. Their heart had a, had a glow to help. But after a while, it was soured because they realized they were being used. Am I describing you? You ever been there? Where your, your, your heart was in the right place, but after a while you just realized, holy moly, I can't raise these people and I can't take care of them the rest of my life. How in the world do I reach out to the least of these when the least of these are draining the life out of me? I don't know what to do. I don't know how to trust them. And I, I was standing in the parking lot of Harris Teeter and they were, they just so happened we ran across each other at the grocery store, and I saw them and I, as I was going into the store, and we sat there and we talked, and I asked them, so how are your guests doing? And boy, I hit the wound. And they went, we don't know what to do. We've never done this before. We, we've taken them in, we've given them every chance, and they went on and on. They said, we, now we've got to ask them to move on. And it's hurting us. It hurts us to do this because I really believe their heart's in the right place. And I looked at him and I said, I, I want to I wanna just tell you folks, I know how you feel. I said, that's one of the wounds of being involved in other people's lives. That's one of the things, that's one of the burdens that you carry, and I know it's not easy. But don't let it sour you on doing good. Don't let it destroy your mission to reach the least of these, because the least of these are there because they don't know how to, to get out of there. They're, they're sort of stuck in this vacuum. And you can tell them all day long, and you can give them a job, you can you find a place for them to live, but eventually they've got to learn how to do this, and they've never done it. And so they don't know how. And so they will lie to you, and they will deceive you, and they will use you at times. But don't let it sour your spirit to help someone else. Because I promise you, the blessings that God will give you are enormous. Don't lose your compassion for people. It is our call. It is our mission. It is how we are preparing ourselves for the coming of the Son of Man. This is what we do. We don't just sit around twiddling our thumbs and going through the book of Revelation. We live it. We take a chance on people. Yes, you're going to get hurt along the way. 
toughen up. Know that it is time when someone comes to you and asks for help, that time is right, right then, to do what needs to be done. We can think of every reason in the world not to, think, to, to take care of them. We can, we can judge them harshly, especially when we are wounded and we feel used. I wonder how many people that came to that day that Jesus fed the 5,000 and all they did is they, they weren't there really listening to his great teachings or what, what great uh, words this prophet was, was giving. They weren't expecting any great miracle. What they were looking for was a what? A free lunch. They came to eat. And Jesus provided for them. His, his disciples sat there and said, well, Lord, we can't do this. This is, you know, this is impossible. And Jesus says, listen, just bring me what you have. And he's saying the same thing to you and me. Bring me what you have and give it all. Don't take the talents that I have given you and squander them and bury them in the ground like the one who did that with the one talent. Because it will be taken from you. Do like the one who had five talents and doubled it. And you will be blessed even more. you determining whether or not they're deserving. Let me ask this question. Did Jesus Christ, who died on Calvary, on that cross, did He die for that person? Not just you, but did He die for the one that's lying, cheating, and taking advantage of you? Did He die for them? Are you willing to? yesterday and at that funeral it was a it was an amazing thing that I found out before COVID we had a man that was awkward awkward in society banished from about every store in Denton literally because people didn't understand him. He found his way to our church. And he came every Sunday. And like most people, we didn't initially look for the bad, no, but we were cautious saying, I can't understand a word he's saying. What in the world? What do we do with this? But yet, he loved this congregation. Now, he didn't always know how to show it. Sometimes he, he, he's just socially awkward. His brother yesterday said uh, he was touched when he was young. It's an old saying for someone that has problems, emotional, mental capabilities. It's what they call, they've been touched. But he loved you. He loved this church. He used to come by my office a lot. And I'd say, hey, Nick, how you doing? And he'd come in and he would say, preacher. And it, it was hard to understand him. Now, I had to ask him over and over, you know, just like you. He says, I want you to let me know when I'm doing wrong. He says, I, I don't want you to run me away from the church. That's what he said. I said, that'll never happen, Nick. We love you and we want you in church. He says, but I think I've scared some people. I said, well, then we can make that right. It'll be okay. He says, I really love this church. Please don't make me leave. Please tell me when I'm doing wrong so I can fix it and make it right. That's what he was trying to tell me. Yesterday I was standing with Pat Marsh at the back of the graveside. And his brother said, let me tell you something about Nick that many of you might know and some don't. He said he's always been touched since he was young. But he's always had a gentle heart. 
and he just wanted to be loved. And sitting under that tent at that graveside yesterday was a lady on the back seats. And I just thought she was a member of the family, but she wasn't a, she wasn't a member of the family at all. He said, let me tell you something that happened to Nick when he was young. He was with other children and they were playing and swimming around a pond. And a little girl got too far out and couldn't get in and started to drown. She said, Nick jumped in the water. He couldn't swim himself. And he found a way to reach her. And he saved her life. That woman married such and such. And her son, who she birthed, became a minister who has reached thousands of people over the last years for the kingdom of heaven. All because Nick Latham saved that little girl's life. And the lady sitting on the back row was that little girl grown up at his, at his funeral. So just when you think you've got somebody figured out, you find out, I've entertained an angel unaware. Blessed are those who give food to the hungry, clothes to the naked, who visit those in prison, who bring healing to those who are sick. Blessed are those that you've touched that lied even to you, for you became Jesus to them. And we, many times, we don't realize the lives that we can touch by saving just one person. As we go into this new year, my friends, I want to challenge you. I'm challenging myself. Let us walk that walk because we are serving a good and loving God who goes to the furthest depths of the ocean. He will go as far as you have found yourself lost to bring you in to the kingdom of heaven because He loves you. And He uses people like you and I. And yes, we do entertain angels unaware along the way. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we face a new year, if this is the year of your coming, with all your glory, with all your angels, Lord, let us be found doing the work of a disciple. Let us be a compassionate people and a loving people in a world and in a society that, that shows none of those things. Lord, if we, the church, cannot be the example, then God have mercy on all of us. Because we need it. Transform our hearts, O oh Lord. Give us the desire to live our faith, to be that the spirit can reside in and use us, O oh Lord, to do whatever it might be you've called us to be, whether we have five talents or whether we have only one. Let us give it all to you so that when we stand before you in the end, we will be received into your glory. And we pray this in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let's all stand and we're going to close with our hymn. There's a song in the air.
Go forth in the name of Christ and serve Him well until we meet again to worship our Holy Lord together next week. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.